Wiesner of Local Future. It is June the 8th, 2020, and this is segment two of our discussion with Nicole Foss, futurist philosopher from New Zealand. Nicole, how are you doing? I am doing very well, thank you. It's so nice to see you again today. <laughs> so our topic today, Nicole, for this segment is um, money's attack on the third world. And can I tell you a story before we start? Sure. Okay. So in the last week, I've been um, contacted by a few Africans, actual people who live in Africa, live there, and who are trying to, you know, just take care of their friends and family. And three of them are trying to grow farms, like kind of forest gardens. At least two of them are starting on these forest gardens. One of them's really working on water, making sure there's wells. And another one is kind of doing some agriculture, but I think with a little bit of um, encouragement, a forest garden might be in the offing. And you're, you're familiar with forest gardening, like permaculture. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe we both took that training class in Belize. Is that correct? Except different years. Yes, uh, yeah, I went twice. Um, so the first time I was taking it, but I was also teaching some of it. And the second time I was teaching it. And the second time I brought my eldest daughter along with me and took her thoroughly out of her comfort zone. And at first she just didn't know what on earth to think of it. I mean, there's mud, there's bugs, there's rain. And she, she just spent a couple of days not enjoying herself very much. But at the end of a couple of weeks, she absolutely loved it. And yes, it, it was a superb place to go. Christopher Nesbitt teaches fantastic permaculture courses, more affordable than a lot of other places. And you really get a sense of what it's like to live in a place where money isn't that much of a thing, where people are living and exchanging things, working to feed themselves, helping other people. You still need money, obviously. And, but it, money doesn't feature as much as it does in a place like this. People are doing a lot more things with their own labor. They're walking places or, or punting up a river rather than taking a car and things like that. And so they're, they're, and they're growing their own food. They're putting their own work with their own hands into things rather than having, having machinery and things like that. So I, th I thought that it was an absolutely brilliant way to take people who've lived in a very sort of technological button pushing kind of society and teach them that you can live perfectly well with very much less. I mean, there was no electricity in those cabins. There was occasionally a little bit of internet, but not a whole lot, uh, not a lot of, of power. And things, but it was it was brilliant. We absolutely loved it, and the course itself was fascinating. It really was. Christopher Nesbitt is a fount of knowledge, and his his discussions of the the Maya culture I thought were really really interesting. So I, I would definitely recommend that course to anyone who wants to go. You end up flying into southern Belize in a little tiny plane. It's a bit like a bus, as in ring the bell here if you want to get off. <laughs> You know? and so, I remember, yes. Yeah, you just and this tiny little airport about the size of your average living room, and then then you get in the, in the back of a truck where you have all these people and their stuff, a totally truck, overloading yeah. a pickup truck, and then you drive for an hour on bumpy roads, hoping no one falls out of the back. <laughs> then you get punted up a river for about an hour by a native guy who's made his own dugout canoe, and yes. then you walk up a hill to get to the place. And it is just brilliant. It's a sort of experience that every Western kid should have to just take them out of their comfort zone and put them in a position where they can learn what really matters in the world. So um, for the viewer who might not be familiar with this term permaculture or permaculture design course, which mm -hmm. you've taken two of, I just well, took the that. one, <laughs> but um, but before we start talking about money's attack on the third world, this is kind of the solution side, right? The permaculture yeah. side. And so what, what is really the permaculture philosophy or what is it? Well, that everything is connected to everything else and that you, you have to work things out as a system and you need to work with nature to the extent you possibly can. So you're studying nature to see how the natural world has evolved for things to work and you use those mechanisms where you possibly can. And you design your space so that it will be as ergonomic as possible so that the things that you, you need most regularly are right near you. 
and then things are slightly further away if you don't have to access them as often and further and further away. So you would have five zones, um, depending on, on how often you would have to visit that part of uh, your space. And it teaches you how to use your landscape, how to know your landscape and use the aspects of the landscape to your advantage and minimize the things that could be a disadvantage. So you're looking at wind breaks, maybe if you, if you don't want the wind to be in a particular place, you're going to plant a, a row of trees and you might think deciduous or, or coniferous, depends whether you want to block the wind all year round or, or only in one part of the year. So you're looking at the, the sun is your energy input, the wind is your energy input, water, you want to use slope to manage your water system on your property, for instance, there are so many ways that things are tied together. Now, understanding things like all the, the diversity is maximum at the edges between different zones. The edge effect. It's absolutely brilliant, brilliant system invented by uh, David Holmgren and Bill Mollison. Um, Bill Mollison is dead, but David Holmgren is still very much alive, uh, living in Meliodora, <laughs> uh, Victoria, Australia. And he's, he's one of the most brilliant systems thinkers I've ever met in my life. He's, he's just amazing, absolutely amazing. But when you build a system like this, you put the effort in at the beginning with the design, you set yourself up so you, you put things in the right places. You have things that grow, not just different areas spatially, but vertically as well. So you would have things that are growing tall. So you have your upper niche and your middle niche and lower niches. And things are just all organized in a way that makes sense. And then what you've created is basically abundance. And you don't have to put an enormous amount of work in later because you've already done the work at the design stage. So then you're surrounded by abundance and you just help yourself. And you produced a food forest that generates food for you, hopefully all year round, although it is going to depend on your, on your climate. And food forests don't all look the same. <laughs> They're just very much going to depend on where you are and what will grow where you are. But even the desert, you can do this. So if you want to see how to do this, watch Green in the Desert, <laughs> which was a permaculture film. Uh, so by, by the Permaculture Research Institute, Jeff, Mm, can't remember his last name. It's on the tip of my tongue, but it's missing. So yeah, there, there are ways of doing this. You can, you can create abundance. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes thought, but you absolutely can do it. And this is very much what people should be doing. So can I tell you a little, little more story about um, my interactions with Africa? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm interacting with a person in um Ghana one north of there in Burkina Faso one in Kenya and one in Uganda mm -hmm. Uganda um I also connected with a, a man who who has been there like a, a European style man who's been there trying to help his name's Vincent Lin and um he's, he's a former actor and kung fu um martial artist and he, he just has been very interested in, in Africa ever since he, he first visited and saw the plight of some of the people there, the children in particular. So at the moment uh, in, in Uganda, all the way on their western border along the Rift Valley, there has been this horrible flood in the last month. And the rainfall, you know, covered the hillside the water came down, it covered the farms, the water came down, it washed towards one of their great lakes to the north, and it took away many villages, it just flooded them out. They're just full of mud, the houses are full of mud, or they're washed away. And so there's 100,000 people, more or less there, who ha have no homes, they have, have no food, because all their food has been sold to other countries because for export, and the entire country is hungry. And not just the entire country, but the orphanages, the kids left over from the war in Rwanda or, or wherever it was a decade ago, the kids are still there, you know, and, and they're, they're, they're in orphanages. And um, so I'm trying to think about, you know, what to do. Not, not, not as in what do we white, you know, first world people do, but, but what sort of knowledge can we help them get so that they can think about this in the, well, you know, we've got our immediate needs, but then we have our midterm needs, but then our long-term needs are really, we need to re regrow the rainforest. 
because the rainforest is what mm -hmm. holds everything together, not just on the plains, but on the, the mountainsides. So um, what would you, what's, what's, how, what would permaculture say about this as far as reaching out to these people and then helping them to understand that this is just going to continue and continue unless permaculture. One of the big problems with this is that permaculture is inherently a long-term thing. You have to have the long-term view in order to even think that way. And if you grow up in a place that's violent, unstable, and where you don't know where your next meal is coming from, you have no long term. People will not do permaculture in places where they don't know where their next meal is coming from. They don't have the resources. You, if you don't have a cushion, because it takes quite a lot of effort at the beginning, you have to, well, you have to have the land in the first place, have access to the land, and then you have to know what sort of things will grow there, and you have to then plant them, and some things that you're going to be planting, it's going to be trees, because permaculture absolutely is going to involve a lot of trees. You may not even live to see those trees grow up. You know, people don't have a long-term view in places like that. I remember uh, from Christopher's um, permaculture course, he was telling me about how the population had increased in the area that he was living in. And at first, it was, people didn't Southern live in, Belize. Yeah, people didn't live in the forest like he does. He's the, just about the only one who actually lives on his farm in the forest. Most of the people live in the village and walk out to, their, to the land that they farm. And there's, there's a, a patch of land, a sort of circle of land, kind of like a green belt, if you like, where people are supposed to go and, and plant things. Everyone can have access to it, and you go and you plant things. And what he said was over the time that the population had basically doubled over the last, I, I'm not sure what time period, it might have been two or three decades, he said that the, the competition over that bit of communal land had got really intense. And people were trying to plant trees. Other people would come along and cut them down and say, you're trying to hog this bit of the, the communal zone for yourself for the next 30 years. We're not going to let you do that. This is communal, so you can't plant a tree. So this, this is the kind of thing that happens when you start to get population pressure building up. The kind of communal solutions that actually allowed people to take the longer term view are not there anymore. And that's really the problem, that unless you can do something about the longer term view, then it's going to be extremely difficult to convince people to do things where the return is delayed, because they can't afford that. If they, if they don't have enough resources to do more than just live today, a lot of these people. They, they don't have the resources to say, well, I'll just take this percentage of my net worth and I'll invest in, in this plantation of trees over here. And then in 50 years, my kids will have a plantation of trees. I mean, it, it, that just doesn't, that's not the way you think if you're living day to day. And even, even in the developed world, this is happening. You're stuck because you have so many people who live paycheck to paycheck. They don't have the longer term view either. And this is going to be a huge impediment all over the world to trying to bring in the kind of solutions that would make a difference. Because for those solutions to take root, you have to have people with the mindset that will allow those seeds to, to grow. So I think it's extremely difficult if people in a place that's badly run now, I, I'm not commenting on how Uganda is, is run. I haven't been there. I don't have a lot of personal knowledge of that. But, but a lot of places in the developing world have not historically been terribly well run, partly because some of the leaders have been basically installed by the West anyway, so they don't really care about their own country. They're just being bribed to be there to hand over <laughs> their country's silverware to multinational corporations. And, and even other leaders who, who haven't come up in that way are not necessarily really all that good at governance. What you tend to get is people, you, you tend to get groups of people and then one group will end up in power. And if you have a really short term time horizon, what you do when you get in power, because you, you don't know how long you're going to be there, chances are you're going to be deposed, assassinated or something, and then your group will be out for God only knows how long, and some other group will be in charge. And if you are only in charge for a short period of time, you don't know how long, but you're pretty sure it's gonna be short. 
what you do is you you just take everything you can from the treasury while you possibly can. You use it for your for the benefit of your group while you control the levers of power. And then when you're out, you hope that you got enough booty to be able to survive until your group comes back into power again. But if you have that kind of, of us, it's kind of a, it's a tribalism view, but if you have that kind of tribalism view, and this is growing in the West as well, by the way, and so we're going to see the exact same dynamics happen in, in our countries that have been going on in these other places for a long time, and you, you get people in power and they have no incentive to invest in the country. With, when you have a short-term view, investment makes no sense. You're just getting through from day to day. You don't invest for the future. So the only way to really deal with that is to have more stability. And you have to have stability for a while because you have to build up trust. And trust can be destroyed very quickly, but it takes a long time to rebuild again. So I think, if, if there's any way to try and help with this, it would be a question of going into places where there's a reasonable amount of stability already and trying to work with these people to create something that is then an example for what can happen. So if you can give people living examples of things in their own context, roughly speaking, as in Africa, maybe not their own country, but but within roughly their own context, if you can show them an example of something that works and say, you too can do this, and then you can be independent, you don't have to be under the thumb, then I think that would be the way to go. I think it's also going to take the developed world backing off, though, and I'm not convinced that's going to happen anytime soon. Because what you need for these countries to come into their own is for them not to have constant meddling and financial exploitation because these countries are being actively underdeveloped all the time so they they get some jobs but they're very poorly paid jobs there's there's no real technology transfer there there really aren't much in the way of skills being taught to these people they're being exploited the resource their resources are being used to turn into products for other people to enjoy they get a little bit of money that isn't adequate compensation for the risks they take and then all the pollution from the extraction of the natural resources and the processing of the natural resources all that pollution stays in that country as well so they get all the downside and none of the upside and they're constantly having to pay interest on the debt that uh, that the the financial institutions have got them into. So their income is being constantly drained away at the same time as things are being destroyed. And if people well, let's, do- let's just, let's just imagine that some, um, some people in the third world, in the developing world, whether it's South America or Central America or Haiti or mm -hmm. Africa or Yemen or uh, Syria or wherever it happens to be, Let's imagine they're watching this. Maybe even like somebody who's in government and who has a kind heart. You know, what What would you say to them? Would you say, you know, stop selling stuff, especially food, you know? Don't sell food out of your country if anybody's starving. Or, you know, um, become an aut autarky, you know, become your own independent nation as quickly as possible. Or if you're not in a position of power, would you say, don't sell your crop, just don't, you know, make connections with your neighbors and see how you're going to use that crop to make sure everybody's fed. And at the same time, you can start growing a food forest and you got to grow those trees because the only way you're going to keep soil fertility is those trees. And, and they have this, um, this one tree in particular in Africa that, that was very common over the um, sub-Saharan area, which, which makes this, um, um, this like, the, the, it has like a, do you remember in- um, Acacia? Bel no, in, in Belize, do you remember going to like an orchard where there was cocoa co growing? Mm -hmm. and, and these fruits, these fruits were like this white fruit that mm. were really quite delicious, but perishable as anything like you could not take that to town literally it is so soft but delicious and easy to eat right and then inside's the seed which is you know dried and ground up to make the cocoa or the coffee or maybe it was the coffee i don't remember 
but um, they have a similar similar tree there. Um, so grow those trees, for example. So, yep. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I think that that does make a lot of sense. But we, we really are going to have to work on the the geopolitics because I think part of the problem is that when people try to be self sufficient, this is a threat to the powers that be. Now, perhaps just the powers that be in their own country. But if it if a movement to say not sell stuff took hold in a country, then it would become a threat to the powers that be on a on a global scale, and they would probably intervene and do something about it. It depends what size country you are. You, some countries can get away with that. Um, India, for instance, um, decided not to, to sell paracetamol anymore. They make the vast majority of paracetamol, Tylenol that would be in, in North America. So they just said, oh, well, we make a lot of these pharmaceuticals. We're not exporting them anymore because uh, this virus is coming around. We reckon we're going to need these for our own people. So we're just going to keep them. And nobody went and invaded India over that. Now, if it had been a smaller country with much less power, then chances are they wouldn't have been able to, to impose those kinds of conditions. And even within a country though, if you try and, and get out of the system, so you decide you want to be autonomous, you want to have your own food forest, you're, you, you have woody agriculture, you've got all your, your required food and things, all the things you need, assuming that this was possible, somebody would come along and say, you're not paying taxes. <laughs> Because you're not part of the system, so you don't have any money now, and you're not paying taxes, so we're just going to take everything you have. You know, any kind of decentralization initiative is going to be seen as a threat, because human political systems, all of them, do this. They all send money from the bottom to the top. That is their purpose. Some of them do it more efficiently than others. They do it in different ways, but that is what all of them do. And so when we try and say one is better than the other, they, they all do that. <laughs> and when you try- but What I you hear you saying is any participation in a monetary economy where there is money well, is going to end up doing this eventually, maybe not yeah. on the first day. It's not but... even just with money. <laughs> I mean, if you're, in a, if you're in a family, you're a subsistence farmer and you have 10 kids, well, you're going to get more work out of those kids then it costs you to feed them. Now it might not cost in terms of money, it might cost in terms of labor, because if you're a subsistence farmer, you don't have any money. But the point of having 10 kids was so that you could get more labor out of them than it cost you to feed them. Then they have to go off and do the same and rinse and repeat for generation after generation, which is why agriculture leads to the expansion imperative. But even at that tiny, tiny scale and without money involved at all, you still have a situation where you, you as the farmer, the one form of means of production you can control, proletariat means their only wealth is their sons. So they can control that one factor of production. So they do. And they generate workers, they feed them, but they're getting lots of work out of them. So it, it's as if you were in a company and you have employees and you're basically creaming off a surplus from what your employees make. You know, some people say this is this is entirely a bad thing. In the case of the company, it's not entirely a bad thing because the people who set up the company, they're the ones who are taking the risk. You know, they're probably paying themselves very little, at least for the first years of the company. So people who are running a, a useful kind of company are working hard and things, and they deserve to be to be compensated for the risk that they're taking and the effort that they put in. So I don't have a problem with, with a certain amount of surplus going upwards. At the small scale, it's not pathological. At a small scale, it's just human. It's just what people do. But like everything else, when you scale it up, now you've got a giant sucking sound that is sucking wealth from the entire world. That's what globalization really was. So it was, we, we sort of hit, hit, we're hitting limits at the end of the seventies within our own countries. So the way around limits to growth at that time was to expand spatially and temporally to try and get more resources to the political center. But one of so, these countries say, um, IMF, World Bank, we're done. <laughs> And they'd probably end up invaded. I mean, there I are hope. countries, <laughs> well, or their leaders get assassinated. You try and bring in a gold dinar like Gaddafi, for instance, or, or Saddam Hussein. <laughs> you try. Are and you saying that these were not bad people? Well, yes. 
but you can you can be a bad people a bad person and still be trying to do something that would be to the benefit of your own country in theory and, and i i actually think saddam was considerably worse than than Gaddafi. Gaddafi, one thing that interested me about Gaddafi is he always called himself colonel normally people in like him who promote themselves to president call themselves general and cover themselves with medals of all sorts he just stayed colonel Gaddafi the entire entire time but that he was he was in power and his people is, is the story that we know him. about him true i mean no I mean, to us to an extent but he's not the monster that people painted him out to be i mean there's there's literacy in and medicine in in Libra there was before he before it got wrecked again recently how's this similar to um cuba and venezuela it's quite similar quite similar so you had someone who was very much in central control but who was minded to actually do some things for his country. Now, I'm, I'm not an expert on Libya or Gaddafi or Cuba or Castro, but just in terms of at an overview level, you had a leader who had central control and was actually trying to do something for his own country. I'm sure he was feathering his own nest too, but we're not talking about angels and devils here. We're just talking about complex humans who have good and bad aspects to them. But definitely, Gaddafi could have been a lot worse for Libya than, than he was. And what Libya is now is vastly worse than it used to be under Gaddafi. He tried to break away from the global financial system and he was assassinated for it. And his country was ruined. And Can I lift an, up an, another name for you? This is mm -hmm. um, Burkina Faso. And there was a revolution in 82, 83, and the the leader of the revolution who wanted to make it into an autarky where everybody was growing food and everyone was treated equally his name was thomas sankara mm -hmm. and um he was murdered four years later by mm -hmm. the elites apparently the ones who yeah you can be murdered by the elite in your own country you don't have to be assassinated by someone from abroad if you're trying to to decentralize that will be seen as a threat even to the elite in your own country so there you have these nested scales so you have the family within a village and then you have corporations are bigger than that regions and they, they're all nested within each other and at each degree of trend this is is the dynamic that happens so even if you look at only the smaller scale within a relatively small country if you are trying to make the system go in reverse, which it does not like to do, you will be perceived as a threat to that system by the people higher up the financial food chain than you are, and they will take you out if they can. So like MLK so, Jr. as well. Yeah, it, it's really, really difficult. And the only time that you really get through to change the system is when you're in a period of expansion. And when people are sort of coming together and things are optimistic and people are, are happier and looking for the common humanity and looking to be more inclusive, then things improve. But unfortunately, movements like civil rights type movements are not likely to get much traction in contractionary times, because those are the times when the worst side of human nature comes out. So I, I do think- The fear side, which we talked about in our previous show, right? The fear and the anger, yes. which is based- but it will be for a while. And then once that has run its course, then we can get on with doing some of the things that require more trust and cooperation because building trust and cooperation at that point, at the point where it will get any traction at all, we have to go for it and just do that. More, put more emphasis on that than, than almost anything else because that's what will make society function again. And that's what we really need. If you can create a functional society where it's not all about just extraction and exploitation, then you can start building these systems that actually provide for people. But the exploitation side of things has to break down first, because if you've got people very much more powerful than you who are up here somewhere when you're like this big and, and down there somewhere, and you're trying to set up something that would make you independent so you don't have to follow the bosses anymore, they're going to take that personally and they're probably going to come in and wreck things. I mean, there so, have been a lot of instances of that in the world. So if the, do if the dollar, like in previous weeks, we've talked, you've talked, and let me just please summarize. Mm -hmm. You've talked about how we are looking at a major deflationary event at the moment. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. But at some point, that's going to become an uh, inflationary and not just inflationary, but hyperinflationary. Mm -hmm. And hyper hyperinflationary means that the money is actually going to become worthless eventually, yeah. where yes. you, you could you could instead of cooking your meal with the wood that you would have bought, you just burn the bills and cook it with that. So yes, at that point, 1923. So if, at that point, I mean, if there's a collapse in the dollar, for example, the U.S. dollar globally, most of the other currencies are, they're all tied to each other. So this hmm. could be a collapse of all currencies simultaneously, well, more or less. And that, would be, currencies. and that would be the moment at which people who have been practicing permaculture in their secret little way and who have hmm. saved a lot of seeds to hmm. be able to distribute to their farmer neighbors and whatnot, mm. this would be an opportunity for them to, to rise as a teacher oh, of yeah. their community and bring people in and say, hey, this is permaculture. This is what we're sure. going to need to do now. And mm -hmm. you know, you can't eat these seeds. These are trees. They're going to grow fruit. It's going to be a little while. I mean, some of this yeah. stuff could be done in advance, right? You could secretly plant these seeds all over the country. Oh, yes. And, and yes, these little, these little right shoots, now. these little shoots would be coming up and people would be like, where'd all these, this is really weird. You know, where, where yeah, all I mean, these little that wouldn't really make a food forest, but it would be a great thing to do. That's what Johnny Appleseed was doing. So he was just going around planting apple seeds absolutely everywhere, just randomly. And and then you have apples all over the place. And that was a real person. Yeah. Yes, people should be doing this and they should be doing that right now. It's not as good as a food forest because it's not coordinated. It's just sort of random, but it's better than nothing at all. And it's a start. And at least then you've got your seeds growing. So you, you don't just want a seed bank, you actually want your seeds growing all over the place because that way it's impossible for someone to come along and take them away and wreck them. There is a movement to control the food supply. So Monsanto, for instance, well, now it's been sold to Bayer, but, but these, these big agricultural companies want to control the food supply. They want to control the seeds so that only their seeds are allowed to be grown and often they're terminator seeds. So you have to keep buying every year. You have to spend more money to you buy. You can save the seeds, but they're dead. Yeah. They won't yeah, grow. You can plant them and they, nothing will come up yeah. from so any of them. you have to save the heritage seeds. And even the ones that are not terminator seeds, they're often F1 hybrids. If you buy commercial plants. So an F1 hybrid is where you take one kind of plant and another kind of plant with the same, the, they're the same. They're the same plant, but they have different variations. And you you would breed them together, and the offspring will be heterozygous. So, for instance, just as a trivial example, brown eyes, blue eyes, and then you, you get a kid who's probably could have brown eyes, but has a gene for blue eyes too. They're heterozygous, and when they have kids, hetero means can, two different genes. Yeah, you've got two genes for the same trait. In the, this example, eye color. And, 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 and the peas, brown, the green brown, and yellow peas and wrinkled and smooth peas. And right. So the, the brown, in this case, the, the dark brown eye color trait mm. is the dominant one. Yes. And, and the and the light color blue trait is the, the recessive one. Yes. And as long as you have the dominant one, you're going to have brown eyes. Yes, exactly. Even, you only need one copy. Because you, so you could you have two, two, you could have two browns and you're going to have brown eyes. Yes. You could have a brown and a blue. You're still going to have brown eyes. You'd yes. have to have two blues to have the blue yes. eyes. Exactly. So when you have seeds that are F1 hybrids, they will show the dominant trait, but they won't necessarily breed true because they'll probably cross fertilize themselves. And you're going to find some of them come out with a recessive. Some of them come out heterozygous and some of them are now homozygous for the dominant trait, but it won't necessarily breed true. You have to breed over a long time to get something that will breed true where you know exactly what you're going to get. So this is what people have done with animals and, and plants. I mean, all these different breeds of dogs. So learning about the seeds that grow in one's country would be really, really useful. Oh, yes. And saving those <laughs> seeds and having some saved in various different places and yes. planting them in secret places as well. Like and knowing your vegetation zone, knowing your microclimate. So really make a point of knowing what will grow in the area where you live. And so it's talking to elders year. and grand- Absolutely. Companion planting strategies as well. So things like the Three Sisters companion planting that we talked about uh, last week. So there, there are ways that people have learned over long periods of time 
to grow things in that particular environment that really work. And so that's the sort of thing to learn. And if people can learn all that now, even if they can't necessarily put it all into practice at the moment, if they've got the knowledge and they're spreading the seeds so that they're the the heritage seeds are just all over the place. There's no way to stamp them out if they're everywhere. If they're all in your seed bank, someone come along and take it away. But if they're just everywhere and your neighbors are growing them and everybody around the place is growing them, there's no way to get rid of things like that. And then you have some kind of control. And one of the things about a food forest that can be quite interesting, you can make it not actually look so much like a food forest. It can look kind of chaotic. And if people don't recognize what it is, then they might not see it as a threat. So you might want to set up a food forest in a place that that isn't, say, necessarily your own backyard, where it's obvious this is my food forest on my property, but do guerrilla gardening on things and set up aspects of food forest in places that don't look to the, to someone who, who doesn't understand what, what they're seeing. This is not necessarily going to look like a means of giving you food sovereignty, but so it's what still I'm, what I'm visualizing is in Michigan, for example, we have these, the entire state is divided into these one mile by one mile squares. Mm -hmm. And those squares are divided into these like 40 acre parcels in most cases. Mm -hmm. But that center, which is a half a mile from either direction, mm -hmm. if, if you look on a satellite map and zoom in on these mm -hmm. blocks, that's almost always got a small stand of trees not even a lot because nobody's there. Nobody yeah. has a house in the mm -hmm. middle of these blocks because it's a half a mile from anywhere. So yeah. so planting around as long as it's not already being farmed. You know, if, if there's if there's like vacant land, it's far from the road. Nobody's mm -hmm. gonna like walk past it. But planting stuff that's gonna grow and not be not be growing like next year for eating food, but maybe three or five, ten mm -hmm. years from now. That's not a bad idea. Oh, that's great. That would be superb. And if there are other places that are set up in the same way, they should definitely think about doing the same kind but, of thing. But not right next to the road. Yeah, you, you don't particularly want things to be obvious. The more you can do under the radar, if you're trying to decentralize, do it under the radar until you reach critical mass. Once you've reached critical mass, you can step out from behind the curtain and you've already, it's fait accompli at that point. You, you reach critical mass and the world will change because you've already got the, an unstoppable amount of momentum in a particular direction. So it seems like there's some other things that could also be happening now as far as educating the children, you yeah. know, that this is what grows in our country. This is what our yeah. history and heritage is. This is what these seeds look like. You know, this is what the plant looks like. This is why we want to have trees because without trees, we have flooding and with flooding, mm -hmm. we have famine. And, and mm -hmm. so there's a lot of things that could be taught in people's minds. Mm -hmm. And it, once it's in their minds, you know, if, if things kind of simplify on the economic mm -hmm. level, like we're, we're talking about, then they're gonna be mentally prepared to know mm -hmm. what to do. Yes, I, I, I think, we really need to regard this next few years, the, the sort of the deflationary period, if you like, when, we're, when not much is going to get a whole lot of traction. We need to be educating ourselves, learning the skills we're going to need, making sure we have established stands of heritage plants, um, thinking about how we want to come out of things. So as soon as things start to pick up, what are we going to do? Working on the relationships in the community in the meantime, so that you've got a group of people in the same area who are on the same page, because you can't do this by yourself. You, you're going to need other people to, to work with. And if you are all prepared to go, as soon as the situation allows for it, then you can be up and running really, really quickly. And you don't so mean I've, go like as in evacuate. You mean no, no, go no, as no, in start. In, uh, implement your plans. Yeah. <laughs> So that yeah, that that's what I mean. You know, don't don't leave, but as soon as as the circumstances are allow for for people to come together and do things, then you already know what you're going to do, and you just come together and you get off to running start. So so that would that would be really really useful. Hmm. Now you mentioned uh, deflation and hyperinflation. I just wanted to point out a couple of things. We need to remember that deflation and inflation are monetary phenomena. Most people don't think of it that way. Most people think inflation and deflation are rising and falling prices, re respectively, and they're not. Prices change as a result of changes in the money supply, as a lagging indicator. So we've had a huge credit expansion, 
and prices have risen as a result of that credit expansion. So it was almost like a hyperinflation, except we didn't print physical currency. We created this enormous amount of credit so that we have excess claims to pretty much everything on the face of the earth at this point. And it's those claims being extinguished that will be the deflation. And we'll have to live through that period of time. We do not know how long it will be between the deflation, which is the collapse of, of credit, which will, is the collapse of the money supply, because 99% of the money supply is credit or, or more. We, we don't know how long it'll take to go from that phase to governments printing absolutely out of control and destroying the fiat currency regime. It could potentially be less time than it was last time. So last time we had a 10 year depression uh, in the 1930s. And so we had, we had a deflationary depression that, that lasted a long time. This time things seem to be going pretty quickly. I'm not sure that it'll take 10 years. Deflation and depression are mutually reinforcing. So it could take longer than people currently think. But I think it, it, we are going to get to the point in the next few years, maybe within a decade, of hyperinflation, of just the complete and utter destruction of the fiat currency regime. And at that point, so people have barter networks set up, you know, time banks, any kind of barter network, local currencies and things like that. These are the things that are going to get people through that period because both these, both the deflation and the, the hyperinflation that will likely come uh, afterwards, both of these are going to be situations of extreme instability where you can't count on, on things staying the same from one day to the next at all. It's really, really hard to plan. During a deflation, you want to hang on to cash, but you don't want to hang on to it for too long because you don't want to hang on to it to the point where you end up into hyperinflation. So you hang on to cash during deflation as prices come down, which they will, as the money supply is contracting, prices some things, to the downside. food necessarily. Well, I, I'll get to that one afterwards. But on the whole, in, in general, prices will come down as the money supply contracts. It's so like you think the price, price of cars and the use, used cars and the used car <laughs> price in the US might come down in the next year? Would, would that be like- be giving them away. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was suggesting a 50% decrease, and um, I, I think Nobody people might be shocked by that. I mean, there are going to be so many new cars that there's no buyers for. Why would people buy an, an old car if they can get something newer? Because they're going to be selling off the new cars for next to nothing, too. But what I was what I was saying is you, you have your, your money during the deflation. As prices come down, you then take your money and you make your choices because your money is a handful of choices that you haven't made yet. So you wait until you have more information as to what are the right choices. And you, you wait until the prices have come down to the level you can afford to buy things without debt. Then you turn your money into hard goods. Then you are ideally positioned to face hyperinflation as well, because now all your wealth is in hard goods that are not going to be infect, uh, affected by what happens to the fiat money system. But you better make sure that you have enough hard goods, not necessarily you personally, but your neighborhood, your village. So you don't all need one of everything. But if you get together and you say, okay, you know, we'll have the washing machine and you guys have the ax and you have the chainsaw or whatever it might be. I'm just pulling things out of my head here. But whatever essential equipment there is, if you have enough of it as a group, then you will, as a group, be able to cope. Even if there's there's no money in circulation because it's all been destroyed and, and you could burn it for, for heat and... But well, then it seems to me, to though, there's, cer them. there's certain things that are useful to get soon. Like, yes. for example, in my household, we have packets of seeds, heirloom seeds, mm -hmm. and we have about 100 different varieties. They're mostly just mm -hmm. simple greens and gourds mm -hmm. and carrots mm -hmm. and just all these things. But we can plant those this year mm -hmm. to save seed for next year. Yes. And so investing in that now... Oh, yes. It's not a bad plan. When, because when you're... are cheap. You, if, if, most people could afford that now. You don't have to wait for the prices to come down for stuff that's cheap enough to buy today already. And for stuff like that, for seeds, basic tools, little things, absolutely do it now. Because the prices aren't necessarily going to come down that far. And they might just not be available. Instead of being cheap, they might just go away entirely. So absolutely, for the cheaper things, 
get them right now if you possibly can. So when I, I was thinking more in terms of like homesteads, because most people can't afford a homestead at the moment with whatever amount of cash they and their friends could possibly come up with. But over time, when land prices come down, you may collectively be able to buy an actual farm for a group of 10 or 20 people or something, and then have enough land to look after yourselves. So in Africa, for example, food forest. the prices of land might come down drastically in Africa mm -hmm. and other third world places in the next few years. So being close to that land might not be a bad idea. I mean, having your house mm -hmm. near to the large farm or something, I, I don't know. I'm just, mm -hmm. I'm just trying to think of how, how to give those who are already in the third world some ideas on what makes sense to do for the long think, run, not just the short run, but the long run. I, I definitely think education on, on farming and food production is absolutely huge. Was what happened in Permaculture, Zimbabwe, right? Food oh, forests. definitely. I We're mean, not talking had, about agriculture necessarily. Yeah, they had land reform in, under Mugabe. And basically it was just- Where was Mugabe yeah, again? Uh, Zimbabwe. Okay. Robert Mugabe from Zimbabwe, dictator. Uh, he's dead now. But um, basically, he just took the land away. It used to be Rhodesia, I believe. He took the land away from the farmers, mostly the white farmers, and just gave it to his political allies. But his political allies had no idea what to do with the land. So these productive farms, and this was conventional farming, this was not permaculture, but he was producing food. He was strip mining soil fertility, as conventional farming always does, but at least it was producing food. So you took the, the productive land away from the people who had been producing food with it and gave it to, in small bits, to a bunch of people who didn't know how to produce food with it. And the food production fell off a cliff and you ended up with a hyperinflation and the country went through just horrible, horrible times. So as much as I think land reform is necessary, and I do think eventually it will come, people will simply take it if they, if they have to. Land reform as in property is no longer property. Well, I mean, it does no longer belongs to the person that thinks they own it. Yeah, I mean, reform may, we could look at a lot of different ways. It could be certain groups of people are, are entitled to a certain amount of land or, you know, there are lots of different ways to divide things up. You could put a maximum size on something, for instance, and say, nobody's allowed to have more than this amount. So that just to make sure that things get shared around a little bit more fairly. I don't think it will happen voluntarily because people never give up their property rights voluntarily, but I do think involuntarily <laughs> countries will end up being just swarmed by people who have no other choice but to try and get hold of some land and have some food. And so there will be revolutions in, in a lot of places, I think. But these people need to know what to do with that land. And some of them already do, but some of them don't. And I think if there's any way that we could really start permaculture programs in Africa and, and, and other places in the third world, really share that kind of knowledge so that when people might get their hands on a piece of land, they would know what to do with it, not just for themselves, but for their broader community as well. And I mean, it sounds so paternalistic, the thought of going into someone's country and, and teaching them how to do very basic things. And, and it is paternalistic, but at the same time, if people have been living in a slum, what do they know about farming? You know, it's not that they've all been subsistence farmers at some point in their lives. A lot of people have been raised in, in urban slums, just living in whatever way they possibly could while they were there. But people who live in places like that have never grown food in their lives. They, they've never had any land. So there is a need for education. I think the best way would be to start um, permaculture institutes actually in these countries and as soon as possible, have them run by local people. So you might need people to come in and sort of help to sort of sh share the ideas and things. That analytical framework is something I think that needs to be communicated, but you absolutely need it in the hands of local people as soon as you possibly can, I'm because that would be seen as I'm, an outside intervention. I'm thinking of the greening of Cuba and um, the, the DVD. I've got two of them, two that I think are the same story. Like this one is called The Greening of Cuba. Uh -huh. And this was after the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, yep. I think. And then a similar film is called The Power oh, yeah. of the Community. And again, these are both about after, after Cuba lost access 
to oil <laughs> energy. They had no oil to run their tractors or their cars yes. or anything. And that was where the food was coming from. And yeah. so they had nothing to eat for a while. The average person lost 20 pounds, you know, like yep. uh, almost 10 kilos. And, but they started just growing food everywhere, like in out their windows, you know, in the apartments, yep. in the courtyards, yep. next to the roads. I mean, on the roofs everywhere, mm. no matter, you know, just whatever they could, trees and it was just all over the place because mm. what were they going to eat? Nobody, um, the, Cuba had this embargo around it. The United States said nobody in, nobody out. So they couldn't buy food from anybody. Russia was the only one that was selling them anything. And um, so this can be done, but they did have some people there that had some knowledge to help. Mm. Yeah, I mean, my friend Daryl Taylor, who I mentioned before, was was one of the people who was involved in um, permaculture in Cuba. I don't know if he physically went there himself, but he and, and Darren, like Darren Dort, I think, Australians anyway, the Australian permaculturalists ended up helping Cuba with its permaculture transformation. One one thing that I might suggest is why don't you interview Megan Bachman, who made the film The Power of Community, at the same time as Daryl Taylor, who was involved in actually implementing those programs. Well, I know Megan. I, think... I haven't talked to her in a while, though. <laughs> yeah, Megan ba Bachman and, and Daryl Taylor would be a really interesting combination to have a, a discussion about Cuba. And, Where's and Daryl? Is he in he's Australia? Australia? He's in Australia, yes. He's, he's, he lives in King, King Lake near Melbourne. Central Victoria, and he's brilliant. I mean, you should really, really have a chat with him about building community and things as well. He is just a fount of incredible knowledge. So I will introduce you, but particularly on Cuba, I think having having the two of them um, interviewed at the same time would be would be really good. And these are the ideas that, that we really need to get out there, that there are things people can do. Of course, in Cuba, you can grow food all year round, which is a pretty big help. In Michigan, well, it's a bit more difficult. But To have some it, greenhouses and things. Oh, yeah. That's another thing that you can absolutely be doing right now, thinking about how to put up greenhouses that will extend the growing season. So whatever you can grow, you can probably add at least a month on either end, if not two maybe even more, depends, especially if you can have something that's insulated. And you can have something that's also sort of slightly dug into the ground. So it's ground insulated at the bottom and then double skinned around the top. And then the, the light gets in, but the heat doesn't get out. And you, know, you can grow a lot of things and things like that, building that infrastructure would be a really good thing to do. And that, that's not a huge deal. I mean, it does cost money to build a greenhouse, especially if it's gonna be a, a reasonable size, but, but it's not the same as buying yourself a homestead I mean, a reasonable percentage of people could probably do that, especially if they could find, um, if they go to the dump and find a whole bunch of, of old windows, you can build a greenhouse out of recycled windows from the dump. It doesn't even have to cost a lot of money. And then you've extended your growing season considerably and you've given yourself a lot more food sovereignty. These are definitely things people could be doing now. So I, th I think that this is the point where we have to go to the really root essential thing, which is none of this works if you don't have trust in your community and if you haven't established if you haven't established reciprocal giving friendly loving kind relationships with mm -hmm. the actual people who are actually with an eye shot yeah you have to have relationships of trust they are the glue that holds society together and trust is going to be in short supply over the next while the trust horizon is shrinking rapidly so trust is breaking down Trust determines effective organizational scale. So we are going to find that the effective scale that things operate at is going to be a lot smaller in the future. And it has to rest on re relationships of trust. Anything that people come together to do will help build relationships of trust. So for instance, you could build a communal greenhouse and have your neighbors together come and build something that's big enough for everybody to have some space in. Or just Maybe a community have, garden would be good. Well, you could have an outdoor community garden and then have a greenhouse as part of it. So then you've got all the outdoor space, but you've also got some capacity to extend the growing season. And if you're doing that as a communal project for say everyone on your street, I think that, that would potentially work really well too. And there are probably quite a few places you could do that. Not everywhere, but I mean, if you're urban, it's going to be more difficult. It's going to be hard to be even remotely self-sufficient if, if you're urban. You're going to have to, to learn 
how to how to make things work with humans organization structures. Well, so, Havana kind of did it though in mm -hmm. Cuba. I mean, with all the greening. You you can, but it's it's not as easy. If you've yeah. got more in the especially way, especially in the winter. <laughs> Yeah, if you've got land that hasn't been built on, you have more in the way of capacity to, to be flexible with how you're going to use it. And you can do things, even in town. There's a, a townhouse in Sydney. Uh, the fellow who owns it is called Michael Mobs. I think he might be selling, but uh, he converted <laughs> his urban house in Sydney into an off-grid house. Off-grid for everything. <laughs> he treats his own sewage on his own property. It's his backyard is about the size of the room I'm sitting in. We're not talking a lot of space here, but he managed to be off grid for everything in the middle of the city, including food. Well, he was yeah, he was growing tons of food. I don't know. If, I doubt very much he grew everything that he ate, but he was off grid in terms of power and water and sewerage and the the things you would normally expect to be connected to for for life support purposes. And he was growing, uh, managing to encourage people to grow trees all down the sides of the streets, like fruit trees and stuff, partly for the food, but also because when you're growing street trees, it's so hot in Sydney, you will drop the temperature enormously if you shade the asphalt. So if you're growing these trees along the side of the road, you're reducing your energy requirements because you're reducing the heat island effect and then people don't have to turn their air conditioning on to the same kind of extent. So there are all kinds of ways that, that doing these things can, can be helpful. And so there are direct benefits, but there are also indirect benefits. And we need to think about, about both. Well, we're, we're almost up to an hour here. Um, Let's see what the title of this one was. Money's attack on the third world. I don't, I don't know if we really got to that. Other, well, to other than we did last in the in the last bit of it because we were talking about financial imperialism. So, financial imperialism does involve the involuntary incorporation of new territories. So, any kind of imperialism is going to take over new territories and integrate those territories into a larger whole, and it has to expand. It's another thing great based on Ponzi dynamics. So anything that must grow and must always have new entrance is going to is, is basically a Ponzi scheme and is going to end in the same way. It's it's going to it's going to collapse eventually. So imperialism takes over new territories. In the past, that was done with soldiers, and you would go and invade, and you would enslave people, steal their reserves, take over their land, cut down their trees, and send them back to, say, Rome for firewood or whatever it might be. We've done this financially. So we didn't send in soldiers. We sent in bankers and people like that. We sent in people who were going to encourage uh, third world governments to get into debt they couldn't repay so that they could then suck the resources out of those countries, suck financial resources out, the, the money to repay the interest on the loans, but also other resources as well. So the fact that we managed to create a financial empire has spared people actually the need to send soldiers around and, and there hasn't been the same degree of, of overt violence but it's still, it's incredibly extractive and exploitative. It is using these, the people and the countries and resources in, in other parts of the world to feed and clothe and amuse the people at the political center. So they're the ones who get all the benefits. The people in the third world have all the cost, all the downside and none of the benefits. So we have basically a giant sucking sound and the financial system is sucking all the resources towards the political center. So the political center would be the West, if you like. <laughs> then you have the near periphery, then you have the far periphery, which is for resource extraction. So the poor people get poorer and poorer and poorer. Yes. While the millionaires get richer and richer and richer. It's positive feedback. It's extremely important to, to understand that the world is absolutely grounded in positive feedback. Now, negative feedback, this, this is something that people get a bit confused about. They think negative feedback must be bad and positive feedback must be good, but it's actually the other way around because negative feedback means stability. It means if you start here and something pulls you over here, there will be a force that pulls you back to an equilibrium. So if you've got something like that, if you have a ball and like a, a, ball, children's, a children's swing on a swing set. Yeah, it will come to rest at the minute. You move it away and it will naturally come back to rest. So you've got negative feedback. This gives you stability. 
Positive feedback is the opposite. You start here, you go in this direction and the force is, oh, I'm over here and then I'm gonna go over here some more and then over there and whee, and you, you end up with massive destabilization. So if you do that, you will hit a brick wall and then it will collapse and then something else will come up and take its place. This is how human history has existed through positive feedback at all degrees of trend simultaneously. So you've got these empires that are that are building and the more they build, the more they're, they're empowered to, to go out and take over more. And so you get more and more and more expansion. Eventually, they cannot expand any further. They will hit some kind of natural limit. In Rome, arguably peak wood, I certainly heard that argument made that it got to the point where you had to go so far from, from Rome itself in order to get firewood that it took you more energy to get the firewood back to Rome than the energy in the wood that you were bringing back. So they, they had their own kind of energy issue and they hit their own limits to growth and then collapsed. And it took 1500 years for Rome to recover, for house prices to hit the same level as they had done in, in the Roman empire, it took 1500 years. So when, when you have these, these large scale collapses, it can take a very long time to build things up again. This, this makes me feel, reflect on a couple things, but I really want us to finish up too. So, um, cause we're gonna be back, you and I, and I believe Steve Keen is gonna be here in two hours. So that would be, um, today so it's is- be Yeah, so it's noon my time, it's two o'clock then. Right, so it's, it's um, for me, it's June the 8th, 2020 at 8 p.m. So at my 10 p.m., which is two hours mm -hmm. later for you, Steve mm -hmm. Keen should be here. And we can continue picking up from where we left him off last week. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the things that I, I've, this has not been the first time I've had this thought, is that the people who actually live in, if, if anybody who actually lives in the forest, you know, or depends upon the forest for their life, is there trying to protect those trees, mm. if possible. <laughs> because growing trees back takes a while. You know, yeah. 50, 100, uh, and to grow a really full forest, 300 years or something like that. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm sure I had other thoughts, but w w remind me of the, what was just the last point you made? I was I was talking about imperialism and how you have this extraction through the world right, of right, right. finance. Would it be fair for a person who lives in who is a worker basically anywhere in the world who is employed and that's the only way they have to make a living to feed their family mm -hmm. but more, more more specifically um the people in africa the people in south america the people in south um central america and the middle east and what you would say poor places of the world mm -hmm. it's probably okay for the them to feel angry about this whole system isn't it Oh, and yes. to feel they frustrated us, they look at us the way we look at wall street bankers people who are they look at us as people who are trying to preserve a wealth disparity that's unjustified but some of them think that oh the united states is just so amazing wish I, we could be like them <laughs> this is true i mean it's not that there are people who are fundamentally good and people who are fundamentally bad if you took those people and put them in the situation that we're in they would behave exactly the same as we are. We're all humans. It, it's context dependent. So, so it's not a question of there are good people in one country and bad people in another. We are creatures of circumstance. We, we are the product of our environment. And pretty much any group of humans will push for an advantage if there is one on offer. And they won't give it back in a hurry. So this is, this is just something that the humans do. This is why you have bubbles absolutely everywhere or the dynamics that, that feed into something like a bubble can happen absolutely anywhere. And they don't have to happen over something that has any kind of inherent value. So tulips, for instance, what kind of inherent value does a tulip have? I mean, you can eat them apparently, but it's not exactly a taste treat. And, but for a while they were worth as much as a house. People just get their, their ideas completely distorted at certain times. They collectively take leave of their senses and it can happen anywhere to any group of people. And whichever group of people are currently on top will want to stay there and will want to defend that wealth disparity against all other comers. And the people on the other side will be the ones who want to take it away. And which group is which varies enormously over history. 
pretty much all of us have been on our, all of our groups have been on one side and the other at some time in, in history. It's just history is incredibly dynamic. So this is, this is what we're watching playing out. It's our turn to try and defend a wealth disparity. I don't think it's going to work. I think eventually the sort of wealth, the, the fortress that we're trying to build around the West is, is going to fail because we're not going to have the energy to, to be able to maintain it. And so we're all going to end up at a lower standard of living, but at a much more egalitarian standard of living. Equal. So I think at that point, we can rebuild something without the problems, with all the baggage that we currently have. We'll basically be shedding a bunch of baggage, and then we can start again. All right. Thank you so much, Nicole, again, for being on the call with me. You're if you welcome. are if you are watching, if you could please like the video and um, put in a comment and subscribe and um, uh, sign up for email not notifications and all that stuff. Also, if if you're coming to this show and you didn't watch the previous one, that's that will be uploaded soon, previous hour. And um, the follow on hour with Steve Keen, depending on when you're watching that, will either be two hours from now or available instantly. So <laughs> thank you so much. And um, we'll see you soon. Thanks, Nicole. You're very welcome. <laughs>